Okay, welcome to the Glenn Show. Everybody out there at BloggingHeads.tv. And uh, this is Glenn Marlin. I'm here with John McWhorter. We are the Black Guys at BloggingHeads.tv, well known for that. And uh, we're trying to have a conversation. John's in the community center. In the Jewish community center. I'm in my disorganized office at Brown University. I am professor of economics at Brown. Uh, the Watson Institute for Public and International Affairs underwrites the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, I'm proud to say. And John is professor of linguistics, music, and a lot of other stuff at Columbia University. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're here to talk. So, John, what's up? Day after Thanksgiving, how you doing? Um, fine, but I think um, one thing that we need to address is what happened in our last conversation. And that is that I seem to have rubbed a lot of people the wrong way with my views about Judge Kavanaugh and how I express them. And I want to make clear, folks, that I'm disappointed because, and you've often been disappointed in me, I'm now disappointed in some of you. You're disappointed because in me, John? Not you, Glenn. I loved our discussion. I thought it was oh, okay, okay. But I at one point said, I know he did it. And I said that on the basis of a good 15 or 20 minutes when you and I have been tossing back and forth our feelings about the whole episode and my sense of what constituted evidence and my sense of whether or not Blasey Ford was believable. And we had said those things now. A person might disagree with what I had said. But I think a lot of our audience was reading me as if I had just simply said out of the blue, I just know it. And I'm just saying it from my gut and that I would actually think of that as some kind of logical or authoritative argument. And all I have to say to that is, folks, a lot of you have been watching us do this for 11 years. I'm not sure how many people can actually imagine that I would try to pass that off as reasoning. And I really hoped that this particular audience would understand that I was saying that on the basis of what we had said before. Now, I know it was a rather hyperbolic way of putting it, but I wasn't speaking in just that one isolated Sentence. And I'm sorry if I made it seem like I meant that nothing that I had said before mattered, and then now I was just you know speaking this sentence out of the blue. But I really didn't expect that this audience would read me that way. And I say again, I know that nothing I said constituted an ironclad case. But wow, you know the response to this, and I didn't read many of the comments. But you know, even on this wonderful thing called Twitter, I, I mean, just interject for a moment, John, because some people may be watching this who did not see the previous episode. You must never miss an episode of The Glenn Show, especially when I'm talking with John McWhorter. But on the off chance that you didn't see this one, I just want the audience to know, in our last conversation, or I'd say about a month ago, something like that, three weeks ago, uh, we discussed the uh, nomination uh, in the hearings on Judge Kavanaugh, the uh, sexual misconduct allegations. And John took the position that Judge Kavanaugh uh, wasn't believable in his view and that he probably did it. And some of our uh, viewers commented uh, vociferously and uh, negatively on John, who is now explaining himself. Uh, and I just want people to know that that's what's going on. Uh, we don't have to rehash <laughs> the whole thing. And I'll tell you straight up that I think I understood you fairly well. I think you were saying that as far as you were concerned, although the evidence was circumstantial, you were nevertheless persuaded that Judge Kavanaugh probably did something that he ought not to have done. Do I mistake that? You do not mistake that. That was okay. all. You're and not alone in that opinion, by the way. A whole lot of people have that opinion. No, and I, I can see that I really did sort of, you know, hit a uh, tripwire. But, you know, I, I just wanted to make it clear for those of you who listened to us for some sort of reasoned opinion that I didn't, I didn't have a stroke that day. I mean, I, I've just been <laughs> somewhat surprised. You know, people saying, I've never seen anybody fall so far so fast. You know, it's funny. Somebody said that's yeah, something about me way back. This is eons ago when I had a Lion Heads conversation with Michael Behe, the creationist scientist. And you know what? You know, I'm not sure exactly what I was falling from, but I'm still here and I will continue to still be here. I can guarantee you, Blogging Heads audience, that if I say anything, even if it's slightly colorfully, I'm trying my best to base it on reasoning. I don't just belch for Blogging Heads. So that is my, that is my opinion about that. And I know a lot of you felt fine about what I said on the last one, but there was a certain extremity of response last time that I thought, I would respond to because I want you to know that you know, I want you to think that I'm reasonable. Not right, but reasonable. I don't belch on blogging okay. heads. There. So do you have anything to add to what happened after that one? 
we're talking back to the commenters. That's a, that's an interesting phenomenon. I, I want to just say, make the record uh, complete that I took the opposite view from John and I found the evidence insufficient to come to a conclusion on Judge Kavanaugh and therein lay a debate between the two of us. I want also to say that our friendship is in no way jeopardized by the fact that not at all opinions and I think some of the viewers were concerned that we might be mad at each other. Neither one of us is mad at the other. No, because no. We can disagree about things and still be agreeable about it. No, uh, that was a stimulating session. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're moving on, John. Um, I got to so about. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to talk about Hamilton for a quick minute. But do that. Do that. Because I have you are, you are a man who appreciates musical theater greatly, and it happens that my wife, Lawan, and I were in New York City uh, just last weekend and had to benefit at some cost, I must say, <laughs> of getting in and seeing this show that we've not seen performed on Broadway, man. And the show just blew me away. It blew me. And then, ironically, the very next day, this was on a Saturday night before Thanksgiving, on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I was... I found myself in Washington, D.C. at the uh, Marriott Marquis Hotel where the Southern Economics Association was having its annual convention. Long story short is I engaged in a conversation with a woman from the South, a religious woman, probably a cultural conservative, and we're talking about this show. And she somehow had the impression, first of all, that it was gangster rap. Um, this is a commentary on how segmented American culture is, and that it was somehow anti-American. I think this because of the confrontation that Vice, with, President, Vice President Pence right. uh, Pence encountered when he went to the performance and in the, in the uh, cast admonished him uh, in some way or another. And I was saying, A, you don't know anything about contemporary culture. Gangster rap is so old school, man. You guys, these, this, is, this is the vernacular of contemporary music. Did you check out who just won the Pulitzer Prize in music the last time around? And they're good at it, man. You should hear these lyrics. You should hear the rhyming. You should hear the density of it. You should see the, the hipness of it and the way it just grabs your spirit and whatnot. So it was like compelling. The other thing is, what do you mean it's radical? What could be more patriotic than this? I can't envision anything that would be more patriotic than this. This is taking the American founding and then rendering it in a way that a kid going to uh, PS22 in uh, somewhere in Harlem or something could relate to. He can relate to Alexander Hamilton. He can see where Aaron Burr is coming from. He understands that this guy called Jefferson, who's got a slave hold down there in Virginia, is a different kind of guy than this guy called Hamilton, who's a New York financier. And it's like, he can understand, you know, he can relate to it. He can relate to, uh, how did uh, one of the rappers say, you know, I'm going uh, I'm gonna get rich or die trying. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what I thought about when Hamilton said, don't, I ain't giving up my shot. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I thought about a guy on the make. Anyway, let me not go on too long. This show could not possibly be better. I don't know how it could be better. Oh, Gwen, that's interesting. <laughs> because a few years ago, there was a small kind of dust up about Hamilton among some, some academic sorts. And, you know, I offended some people then, unfortunately, and I get the feeling it's permanent. Some people think that an imperfection of Hamilton is that it insufficiently depicts that slaves would have been the substrate of all of that wealth that you see, that slaves would have furnished the lifestyles of these people. And it's not that there are no slaves in it, but there are people who saw Hamilton who thought that, for example, that a slave should at least have a song. And apparently in the first draft, a slave did have a song. And I think if you saw the show, and I saw the show, you know that as interesting as it would be to hear from one of the slaves, it would be somewhat ancillary to the storyline, and it would make the whole thing longer than most of us prefer a piece to be. So uh, Lynn Miranda did write a slave song, but he, you know, he cut it. And the slaves do not come out and sing about their plight, and the plot is not really about slaves and their role in that economy. And, of course, it's important for America to know that there was slavery in New York City, although I venture to say that some people are still saying America lives in denial that there was slavery in the North. It's something we started hearing in public about 20 years ago to the point where I think educated America does know all the museum exhibits, etc. But there are people who thought that. I personally think that that is being a little too picky. I think that it's implying that 
any time anybody in history who was a slaveholder is depicted at all, then you have to show that they were holding people in bondage, just like you have to learn the gender of the French now. That it always has to be there. You always have to say it, no matter what else they did, such as found this entire nation, etc. And I see where people are coming from on that, but I don't feel that way. I feel that, okay, yes, slaves you know, were part of that society. Alexander Hamilton's story is something else besides that. It's not the sum total of his being. So there were people who thought that. And um, I pushed against it in a Daily Beast piece. Oh, I see. Okay, you addressed it. And uh, life went on. So just as there was this conservative, culturally conservative woman whom I mentioned who was, as it were, kind of criti- critiquing the show from, if you will, the right, there's a critique of the show from the left. I want to say a couple of things. One of them, just a minor observation. I thought slaves were there. When Hamilton says to Jefferson during one of their rap battles, man, these guys are having a rap battle over who's going to pay for the Revolutionary War. How are the bonds going to be handled? Because as you know, Jefferson is George Washington's Secretary of State, and Hamilton is George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, and they got to sort this thing out because the British banker, the French bankers, and the German bankers want to be paid. So they're having a rap battle. And at one point in it, uh, uh, Hamilton uh, is he scoring, you know, knockout blows on Jefferson in this rap battle, turns to him and says something like, or oh, whatever it is you do in Monticello. And at that very moment, knowing what I know about Thomas Jefferson and what he did at Monticello, if you will, I, I felt like there was an indirect reference to slavery. Anyway, that's a small point. I mean, no, mm-hmm. no, the show did not try to make a statement <laughs> of the voice of the enslaved no. people. Uh, no. did under- you don't hear from them. You yeah. did underwrite some of the wealth, not all of it by any means. I mean, please, but certainly it was a slave economy. Certainly south of the Mason-Dixon line, it was a slave economy. And yes, there were slaves in New York. But this is the Revolutionary War, not the Civil War. And I don't know, maybe it would have been a distraction if you want to make a political point, which my southern lady critic said the show was doing, which it wasn't doing. Maybe that would have been the political point to make. But I really think that would have been... I don't know. This is just me, and it's just an opinion. Art, politics, they're not the same things. And you know that there's a certain kind of thinker who thinks that they very much are. And so for them, Hamilton is incomplete without, say, a Sally Hemings coming out and singing a song about how she feels, also giving a role to a talented young black actress. There's supposed to be a male slave who comes out. Or you're supposed to depict somebody being whipped or somebody, a family being sundered. And if you don't show it, then you're not showing what for them is America's main story. I'm then sorry, there's just, the entire cast is black and brown. That's what I wrote. Every major actor there from George Washington on down is a person of color. That's the statement. Right. How, how is not enacting the founding of the United States through the persona of persons of color and not their form of art? More than implicit, more than tacit acknowledgement and recognition of the role that people of color played in the founding and the making of the country. The show makes no sense without us having that history resonating in our minds with every scene. In a way, the fact that everybody is black or brown is more of a statement in that way, especially in that it's couched in, of all things, you know, the rat substrate. That makes more of a statement than any song I think anybody could come out and sing. Any scene of somebody getting whipped in the back, any scene of somebody complaining about being violated, et cetera. I mean, yeah, I kind of thought that, I hate to say, take, took care of it, but that kind of took care of it that it's been recast as a black story. There's such a profound victory yeah. there. By the way, audience, I'm sorry about the background noise. My personal life has made it impossible that I not record this in a Jewish community, so that's what the noise is. Anyway, oh, the um, audience yeah, and just... So, no, no, so let me that, say something. I'm going to say something else about Hamilton, John, uh, which is, and I want your uh, reaction as a linguist. Okay, you say, so it's in a hip hop genre. But the language was exquisite, or and, but and, okay, and the language is, it's, it's not dumbed down. It's not linguistically dumbed down. It's in virtuosity in, uh, it's, it's, I mean, uh, uh, Lynn Manuel uh, Miranda deserves a great deal of credit for simply the literary virtuosity of these lines. These lines, are all saying something deep, and they're saying it in an eloquent and, and graceful uh, kind of way. Yes, yes, it's got a hip-hop kind of beat and dynamic and energy to it, but the language is exquisite, okay? Mm-hmm. There's no profanity in the show. There's, no, there's not a whole lot of uh, jargon of the inner city streets or whatever. whatever. It's no. about the founding of the United States of America. 
and the conflicts of interest and personality that animated the dynamics of those uh, 20, 25 years at the end of the uh, 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. You know, what's pretty amazing is that for decades now, it's been said that if the form of musical theater was going to really relate to the younger generation, there needed to be a rap or a hip hop musical because that is today's popular music, just as what we now consider show music was the popular music of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And yet it never really happened just in fits and starts. It hadn't really happened. And then Lin-Manuel Miranda comes along and actually writes a substantial piece, a piece that's as substantial as Porgy and Bess or 1776 or Sweeney Todd in actual rap and R&B all the way through. That's an astonishing achievement. And for him to get it so right the first time, even at the sacrifice of, and now I'm going to, you know, make a very minor critique of the show, which I don't think is, is, is problematic, as the word is used these days. Problematic is our new way of saying blasphemous. I don't think this is blasphemous. But he makes Hamilton a little bit more of a bro than he was. I think it implies that Hamilton was sort of, you know, down with the homies. When really Hamilton <laughs> being called a monarchist the way he was, it wasn't completely crazy. And the fact that he came from the Caribbean didn't mean that he was this sort of Calypso brother making his way among the white people. That's not the way that person with that life that he lived would have thought of it back then. He basically was an aristocratic white man doing the things aristocratic white men did. Whereas yeah, this show makes you... He didn't have any money, but that doesn't mean that he defined himself against the elites Understood. the way its equivalent might, and for very understandable reasons today. The show makes him seem like, you know, this immigrant brother. We make things yeah. happen. And it's a great conceit. I think it's wonderful. This is art. This is not history. But it does leave people, I think, thinking of him as a little bit less porcelain than he was. That's the one thing that I left thinking. No, but it's still point. one of the best shows I've ever seen. Yeah, the only point I'm making is he had something to prove. He had a little bit of a chip he on did. his shoulder. He was fighting uphill, you know, he had to. thing like that. But yeah. no, he was not a he was not a down home brother, not by not, not by any means whatsoever. No, it was a fun. Uh, so what we're going to talk about next, uh, Camille Foster. What uh, we did last weekend. That's right. I guess I can say young. He was born in 1980. That that means he's almost 40. First, old. we talk about Alexander Hamilton, and then we talk about Camille Foster. But yes, this is the blogger, media entrepreneur. He pulled a bunch of us together for a conversation. John, it was a lot of fun. That really did work. I mean, it was a chance occurrence that we all happened to be in town at the same time. Yeah, and we all got into the studio, and I think it was really sweet. I haven't heard it yet because it just I think it just went up. The day before we're recording this, and I'm dealing with, you know, family. I'll use the word Michigas because I'm at this Jewish community center. And so I haven't listened. Have you heard it yet? Uh, I have heard a part of it. I haven't had a chance to listen all the way through. It's at, is it We the Fifth Column? That's right. That's right. We That's the Fifth right. Column, uh, Camille, uh, K-M-E-L-E Foster, uh, worth listening to in his own right. But, uh, yeah, there was a studio, New York City, John McWhorter and myself, the host, Camille Foster, uh, the young uh, Coleman Hughes, uh, whom I'm calling the Mookie Betts of race commentary these days because he's an undergraduate at Columbia and his pieces in Colette and like places are uh, raising a lot of eyebrows. And Thomas Chatterton Williams, the writer, uh, whose book Losing My Cool I much admire and who's working on another, uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, piece about uh, racial identity and so on. Uh, you know, it was a good conversation. I wanted to ask you something about that because I was thinking yeah. about this the other day. You know, there's a basically a 50 year difference between the oldest person in that room and the youngest person in that room. Oh, he's there's only a, yeah, Goodness. he couldn't be older. And so there's a 50 year difference. And it was making me think, you know, we had from you to him and some steps in between. Do you think, you know, he's, he's the new kid on the block. And he's doing it very, very well. I, I'm so happy seeing him do what he does. And not that he was thinking this himself, but I wrote Losing the Race in 2000, wanting young black kids exactly like him to read it and think, I'm not crazy. I can do this too. And to be honest, for a long time, I was beginning to wonder if that was going to happen. The rise of ta Coates made me think, wow, it hasn't happened at all. And now here he comes. And I'm not saying that I'm responsible for him, but that is the sort of thing that I wanted to happen. And yet, I think you and I both know the sorts of things that he might be up against. And I think both of us have suggested some things that happen. Do you see any progress in terms of, you know, what's called heterodox and it's still called heterodox black thought 
from when you came on the scene saying the sorts of things that you do and now him becoming, you know, I think there's 2018 is the real beginning of Coleman Hughes as a, as a phenom or has everything just stayed the way it was? Cause what worries me is that he needs to think about the exact same stuff that you did and I did and that Thomas and Camille are going through in terms of the social media comments that they get. Is it, is, is this for, are we serving any purpose? Yeah, John, uh, very depressing question that you ask. Uh, you, of course, are describing Coleman Hughes, the young writer, Columbia University undergraduate, and uh, a commenter on matters of race and other things, who's uh, pushed against the social justice worker, warrior, uh, zeitgeist a little bit in, in his commentary. I wouldn't call him a conservative by any means, but heterodox for sure, and um, coming against the grain. Uh, when he questions things like affirmative action or he argues that Columbia should hold on to the core curriculum or uh, whatever. He's there with you. You're at Columbia. You might be able to summarize some of his thinking uh, more uh, succinctly. But you're asking me a very specific question, which is, does the generations go by? Because everybody, I was the old geezer in the room, okay? I'm the guy who's 50 <laughs> years older than the other guy. Nobody was guy. thinking that. But. 50 years older than the other guy. <laughs> Think and, about, I thought about that later. I remember when he was Coleman Hughes' age and he was reading my pieces in the New Republic and saying, huh, that might be worth considering. And it got him to thinking about some exactly. stuff in a different way. And now this cycle is presenting itself again 20, 25 years later with John is the guy in his middle age, sorry, John. And he's no, it's true. pieces and books that are influencing another generation coming below. And are we just going around in a circle and not making any progress whatsoever? There you go. And uh, I think, I think, I think, no, I wouldn't say no progress whatsoever. Uh, but I do think going around in a circle a little bit, uh, maybe it's a spiral. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, it's getting a little bit more circumference each circle, each uh, circum uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I, I don't think it's not that we're, n we're not getting off a of square one. But, the, but <laughs> you mentioned Coates. Uh, and, of course, he's just standing in for a bunch of people that we could name, you know, who are at uh, uh, liberal uh, magazines or uh, writing books and mm -hmm. uh, whatnot about uh, social justice issues. And the narrative, the narrative hasn't changed so much, and we wish that we had had a bigger impact. Um, but, I, but I think a couple of things. I think events are working on our behalf, <laughs> sadly. You think sadly. so? Because uh, uh, the conditions on the ground are, I mean, uh, you take the, uh, the violence and the homicide thing, you know, uh, Ferguson, Black Lives Matter, Michael Brown, etc. Uh, murder rates and whatnot. Uh, true, true. Uh, if you're woke, there's a line that you have to say. In my classes, when the kids hold up their hands and they question something I'm saying, I can almost anticipate what the narrative Four times out of five, right. And it, it hasn't changed that much. On the other hand, um, the, the facts on the ground are really quite compelling and they're, and they're quite uh, uh, quickening. You know, I mean, I, I think they are forcing us to, uh, to, to broaden, the, uh, broaden the discourse. And maybe I'm just fooling myself. I don't know. Maybe do you think it's, it's foolish to think you don't see any, um, you know, any uh, kind of pushback? I, I think I do. No, I, I actually am beginning to see it. I think that there's going to be a narrative. And I think that you get into this kind of hypothetical history. If Obama had been elected in 2008 and technology was such that we were still at the point that we were at then and it stayed that way, no such thing as an iPhone, there's no Twitter, there's no Facebook, and we just kind of stayed in you know, the way things were in, say, 2002, I think that things were really about to turn around then because as I wrote then, many people now look back at my pieces then and say, ha-ha on you. I think that the fact that that man was elected really did stick a finger in the eye of a certain kind of person who said that this country is still founded upon, you know, a racism subtle but powerful that couldn't possibly let a black man become president. I really think, just as I said with you, and you didn't really agree, you thought I had stars in my eyes. I thought that was going to be symbolically powerful. And it ended up not being powerful because Twitter and Facebook came along and reinforced enmity and channels to the rest of the world among people on all sides. And so racists got a bigger platform and got to whip one another up. Leftists got a bigger platform and got to whip one another up. And next thing you knew, a good thing and a bad thing came together. All of these social media could 
bring more attention to something like Trayvon Martin or Mike Brown or even with the cases that, you know, are frankly, you know, I think more Trayvon Martin and then the horrible cases such as Sam DuBose and Alton Sterling. You learn about those things. But then on the other hand, also social media focuses a kind of a know nothing. It's all about racism. We're always sliding back. It's feeling. And so I think that since 2009, things stagnated in a way that they wouldn't have because of social media. But I think that that effect is changing. I think that it's a pendulum is swinging. And I wouldn't have said this a couple of years ago, but I get the feeling Coleman might experience less hell than the rest of us did, partly because I think that many people in the middle are not ashamed of speaking up or maybe they're tired of the stridency. Something is changing, I think, over the past couple of years. And I think social media helps again, which is that moderate views can get out there in a way that was harder before. So you get the Megan down piece, et cetera. The kind of person who's on the left but is learning to understand that the hard left is maybe not making any more sense in many ways than the right. And so, yeah, I'm feeling better than I was a couple of years ago. But then sometimes I just wonder, you know, here the five of us are in this studio feeling this sense of fellowship, like we're all kind of suffering the same sort of thing and fighting the same battle. And I thought, wouldn't you expect that somebody as young as Coleman wouldn't be in this room, that something's supposed to change? There isn't supposed to be somebody 70 and somebody 20 having the same problems. It just worried me a little bit. I think change would be very hard to detect before it happens because I think a lot of people play their cards close to their vest and don't actually see their thinking. I mean, this may again be wishful thinking on my part, but I but I think the line, the 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 pat uh, cliche line about white supremacy done us wrong, all the problems are problems of blatant, tacit, or explicit racism, etc., uh, is thin. I think it's a thin account. I, I think it's kind of subject to being um, overthrown, but that the overthrowing won't come gradually with a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. The overthrowing will come suddenly as people feel safe to come out front with doubts that they've been harboring for some time. So, so that's my, my kind of reading of it. It's like an emperor has no clothes. Basically, the, uh, the pat racial liberalism of the last half century, um, which uh, looks at uh, uh, violence in black communities and sees uh, the oppression of white supremacy, which looks at the number of African Americans in prison and sees uh, a mass incarceration, uh, Nixon, Reagan uh, uh, mediated uh, confinement of black people, slavery by another name, uh, which looks at the test score gap <coughs> and sees institutions uninterested in educating black people uh, and, and not uh, failures of African Americans to seize opportunities that exist. I, I think that whole uh, uh, way of looking at things here, I mean, we're way, way, way down the line from civil rights movement, I'll stop, is bankrupt. I think it's almost self-evidently bankrupt. The emperor has no clothes. No one is going to say it right away. Indeed, they'll cling more closely and more uh, uh, preciously and more desperately to their narrative, uh, but it's it's a it's on a death march. It's it's not going to survive. I'm saying, and I, and for that reason, I think uh, we're going to see more Coleman Hughes's, not fewer. Do you see them in your uh, office hours? I do actually. I'm talking about students of color, a few who come around to me and say, Professor Laura, I didn't want to say this in class, but you know, I was listening to what you were saying and I was thinking, and then they, and then we start a heretical. Uh, disposition on some issue or another in which thoughts that heretofore are not supposed to have been spoken are being spoken to me. These are thoughts that the kid will never dare say over at the uh, student lounge because it will be no. a with his peers. And he may not even believe them, but he's at least beginning to think them, something like that. Um, yeah, the first, the first wave is coming from black children of Caribbean and African immigrants. That kid that you're talking about generally in my experience has a last name that ends in something like Kofa or, or, or Dublu. They have an African last name or they are of Caribbean heritage and you get names like you know, Hughes and you know, those, those names. Those are um, the most common. I think it's partly because they have, you know, very dark skinned, usually parents who came here and endured plenty of racism. Thank you very much. And did fine. And those parents may not quite understand the narrative that's taken place among we, we natives, as we sometimes call ourselves, here. And so, yeah, I know that kid that you're talking about. That kid almost always has Ghanaian, Nigerian, or Jamaican, or Guyanese parents. For it to be a native-born Black American, 
rarer. I find there's a gender difference, which is interesting. If it's a native-born Black American person, that person is more likely female, in my experience. Um, definitely, whatever gender they are, they are not going to speak out with it in class. You know, it takes a really brave person who likes having bad days to be too public about things like that. But, um, no, it's definitely there. Now, I, I would say that in my experience, I've noticed that since I was at Berkeley in the 90s, that person, is there more of it now? It would be hard to say. I'd have to hold all, all sorts of things constant. But, yes, that person exists. The question is whether they have influence. And, of course, Coleman Hughes is one of those people. We're sitting here doing a podcast about Coleman Hughes. But Coleman Hughes is one of those people, and he has said something. Wow. You know, as he said, he doesn't sit there and say it in class because you know, he's a human being. But he writes it on readily accessible media platforms where he could easily be called out. Would the Coleman Hughes have done that 10 years ago? Maybe not. Maybe he is a sign of the times in that. I'm thinking about what things were like in 2007 and 2011, when the only thing you were supposed to say is Obama's not going to become president. It's all about racism. Jeremiah Wright is correct, et cetera, et cetera. It would have taken more bravery then to have those views. But a lot has happened since then. I hope that things are getting different. And I hope that things are getting different, not just because you and I get proven right, but because I genuinely believe that it would help more poor black people become less poor if we let go of certain ways of looking at things that keep people in power from doing the things that they ought to be doing. So we'll see. We'll see. Here's some, one other thing, Glenn, very quickly. Black Lives Matter. Where is it? Yeah, and now I'm sure that there are you know local Black Lives Matter organizations all over the country, and I'm sure they're trying. Somebody's going to gonna say, somebody's going to say, look at these uh, progressive DAs that just got elected in right. a variety of cities around the country. <laughs> People running for your uh, head prosecutor saying that uh, we're going to keep the cops off of the backs of uh, young sure. black people, and we're against mass incarceration. And they've gotten elected. They're not all black people. Uh, Philadelphia has elected one. Dallas has elected one. Uh, L.A. has elected one. Uh, Boston has elected one. It's an African-American woman. Uh, And these people are more progressive. And I'm told, I'm not a political activist, that Black Lives Matter on the ground had been uh, instrumental. Responsible. Okay, that's that's an answer. Okay, so in other words, it's not... No, that's important. So it's not them marching in the street on a national level, but they're having that kind of they're having that kind of effect on the local level. And on the one hand, it's not that I think of somebody like that and disapprove of them trying to keep black people from getting killed by the cops. But if it's true, as you and I would agree that, that, or as Camille likes to put it, that problem has been overly racialized and that the cops really should be prevented from just killing people in general. I would hope that that would be more the focus of the people in these cities, these DAs, et cetera, than thinking that it's only or primarily a matter of racist cops preying on black men. I mean, to tell you the truth, if they do manage to keep, you know, to have fewer black people being killed, then even if technically it means that a lot of white people are still being killed, which is not just, fewer black people being killed in those communities means more black people being alive to go ahead and do the things that they need to do to get past what the past has done to them. But still, it's a, that's a double-edged sword there, that you have people who are in power who do think that what needs to be reined in is the cops' racism rather than the cops' incompetence. Oh, there's a way of looking at this, John, where you could say uh, it's a kind of uh, miner's canary kind of thing where it starts out as a racial complaint because the cutting edge of it, the, the you know, in this case, police violence, police violence, the cutting edge of it is worst with respect to African-Americans, but the problem is generic. It's not only African-Americans. So the people out front might be an activist (laughs) for Black Lives Matter who frame their uh, advocacy in racial terms, but the full extent of the uh, uh, social dynamic might be to uh, call certain policies into question across the board. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with African Americans being the leading edge. No. um, So so that would be fine. That that would be perfectly fine. And so if that's what Black Lives Matter ends up creating, even if it's somewhat different from their original mission, and I'm sure most of them would say it's okay if we say it's some white people too, then that would be an interesting way that history really works in ways that are often unintended. But yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to see real things happen. And so we need to watch that current generation and see what sorts of real life effects it has. Well, but what, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, one of the things about the current generation that I'm especially interested in is how rigidly will notions of racial identity be adhered to 
And how closely will the boundaries of blackness be policed? Or to what extent are people prepared to entertain, you know, transracial humanistic ideas as the bedrock of their moral, uh, moral critiques uh, and not frame issues reflexively uh, and unreflectively in racial terms? Uh, that's part of what really interested me about Camille. Camille Foster doesn't, he's a person whose skin is as dark or darker than mine. He doesn't identify as black. He, he rejects this whole categorization scheme. And you might think that that's just like crazy. That's like somebody who stepped off of a spaceship and doesn't know the culture that they're living in to go around talking like that. On the other hand, I'm prepared to entertain the proposition that there'll be no end to racial inequality until there's an end to race. <laughs> Put it yeah. Until there's an end to race, which of course I don't mean that uh, variation in the population and skin color and hair texture will disappear or that there won't be some kind of identity uh, nexus around uh, skin color and hair texture and uh, cultural heritage and whatnot that resonates with what we understand to be African-American uh, history and culture in America, but that it becomes a lighter garment. It becomes, it becomes something that you don't wear quite so heavily, that you can be more relaxed in and more kind of, you know, easy going about and that you're prepared to kind of share it. You know, if, if uh, this woman, uh, Rachel Dolezal, what was her name? Who wanted a black woman oh, yeah. who wanted to be black or something, or somebody dons a cult, culturally appropriative, you know, whatever, as long as it's not blackface, I'm not, I'm not endorsing that, but you know, you can kind of don't wear it on your sleeve so much. Don't, don't have that be the first thing you think about. Don't have that be so insistently at the core of your, of your self-presentation. That yeah. and, and intermarriage, uh, so-called mixed race, children around the boundaries of the social categories, uh, kind of undermining. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, that's like some kind of right-wing, colorblind mythology that you're going to just disappear race from the question. And I'm not saying that at all. But I'm, I'm saying inflexibility around racial categorization may be inconsistent with the goals of racial inequality over the longer run. And I sense some of this in the younger generation. Isn't, see, that's pure common sense. And yet, in terms of pragmatism, I'm not willing to go that far. I'm certainly not willing to go as far as Camille. And if, Camille, if you're watching this, I know that you don't mind me saying it because I've said it to you more than once. Basically, I just... um. Yes, race is a fiction. Yes, a kid in an in-between color, you know, instantly beach sixes all the notions we have that what we're dealing with is this, you know, dichotomy between white and black. But to tell you the truth, one of the unfortunate byproducts of the way we've been encouraged to look at things like this since the 60s, I would, if somebody called me in as an advisor in some country that was right before all this, I would say, one thing you've got to watch out for is that when you teach the ruling class to feel a sense of genuine remorse about racism. And if the discriminated group has been discriminated against and oppressed for so long that they've been deprived of a truly organic way to feel a sense of pride, they've been ripped away from any kind of homeland and they've come up with a, their own culture here, but that's dumped upon by the ruling class for centuries. What's going to happen is that a great many people who are members of that group after the worst of it is over are going to end up founding a lot of their sense of what makes them special and legitimate upon a sense of being a victim, that professional victim. And that is a predictable kind of identity, but it is a major aspect of what constitutes black identity today, not consciously, but subconsciously, such that for a lot of people to try to take that away would be disorienting them more than most human beings could tolerate, to tell a lot of people, you're not black, you're just a person. And therefore, you can't fashion a self-conception of yourself, that wasn't well put, a self-conception as somebody who endures subtle racism on a daily or a weekly basis. You can't define yourself against an eternally culpable ruling class. That won't work. You're just a person making your way. You're not perfect, just like nobody is, and that's that. You cannot look to white people as this evil or even, you know, a group of people who make you go all the time. You can't take that away from a lot of people in our time slice. Or if you try to, you'll make them so angry that they won't be able to hear you. And so I understand all of this completely. 
when a European person questions why I call myself black, and what they mean is I don't seem to speak the language, I don't move like that, my cultural predilections often don't seem like that. You know, I can talk about the pajama game, how black can I be? And I have to say no. In the United States, there are two things. You're white or you're black. Now, of course, today, as we said in this broadcast that we recorded the other day, nowadays there's this new category, and I've opened myself up to it over the past 20 years. There's something as biracial. There wasn't where I was growing up, and I am not biracial by identity, despite the fact that that's how my cheat swap comes out. I never did it, but my sister did. I just, what you're saying, it's true, but oddly enough, if you try to take that sort of thing away, yes, they're going to be the Richard Spencers who want there to be this delineated class of quote-unquote Negroes, but most of the resistance, the most vocal resistance to somebody like you or me saying, no, we're just people, you know, both of, both of us know, would come from other black Americans. And you got to fight your battles. There are other ways of making people think in a different way. To tell people, you know, for, to be brown-skinned and say, I am just a person. It's not worth it. I think you're trying to take away someone's entire sense of their purpose and what you're going to see on the planet. I salute what Camille's doing, but no, no, I'm black. And I don't think it's a difference in our ages either. I don't think that you could make that cut ice with any significant number of black people, including the ones who are inclined to agree with us about other things. There is race, and we all know that there are fine lines in between. There are hazy cases that does not eliminate the existence of the categories. So no, I just can't, I can't do it. That'll happen after I'm dead, that we get past race as a category. And since I don't intend to die, I actually do have a vision of myself at about 150, enjoying what will be like a science fiction vision where somebody my color or your color can really just be thought of as a person as if we were in some sci-fi movie, but that is not. That's have not you now. read uh, Yuval Harari's uh, book? This is the Israeli historian. The book is called Homo Deus. Well, and, I read his one before, and so I haven't read the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he, he speculates, I think, quite provocatively about immortality and uh, such. I mean, the, the, the sort of uh, narrative of the book is, okay, what are the challenges that human beings are going to face in the century ahead? Uh, what have we faced in the past? Well, we faced war and pestilence and disease uh, and uh, famine, you know, massive famine. Well, Famines are unlikely to occur in anything like the regularity and severity that they have in the past because pretty much we're food secure. Obviously, there are exceptions to that. War is way down, as Stephen Pinker tells us, in the better angels of our nature and so forth, uh, and the number of people who are being killed in conflicts, although, again, it's not uh, trivial, is much less than has been the case in human history. He reinforces the case in his new one, Enlightenment Now, which I want yeah, to uh, Pinker read as well. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And uh, moreover... Um, uh, pestilence and disease, you know, I mean, we, you know, the Black Plague, this kind of thing. I mean, these are things that we pretty much conquered with modern science, again, with exceptions. So what, what lies ahead? And he says, well, one of the things that lies ahead is people are going to want to live forever. You know, people are going to want to extend their lives from uh, 75, 80, 85, 90 to 130, 150, 175 and look to science as the, as the way of doing it. Um, he has some really interesting, you know, he says another thing that uh, what will come, the quest for mankind has become in the rich part of the country, of the world, is uh, happiness. Not only are people going to live forever, but they have to be happy all the time, uh, and so on. Okay, so he goes on like that. And the other thing is we want to be gods. We want to we want to have cyborg-like implants that increase our intelligence. We want to use genetic screening technologies to make sure our children are all six foot two and perfect specimens and whatnot, and of uh, what manner of, what with artificial intelligence and the kind of merging of the biological and the <clears throat> technological spheres into what kind of beings will come to inhabit the planet. This is the kind of speculation that he's engaging in. It's fascinating. I highly recommend the book. But I wanted to comment a little bit about your, uh, your uh, talking about racial identity and whatnot. Because I, I, I've got this speech that I've been going around giving of late, and gets, it gets pretty good reviews. And the last line of it is, I am a black American intellectual, and I must stand with my people. That's my last line. And it, it typically gets, uh, gets the audience really excited because they really, really like it. Uh, and I'm wondering, why did I write that sentence? I mean, that sentence revealed something about, about me. You know, how do I understand myself? Coming out of the south side of Chicago, raised in a working class African American New York. Uh, you know, I'm a theoretical economist who's devoted a good chunk of my 
writing and thinking to thinking about racial inequality. Now, why is that? I mean, that's clearly got to do with something about me being black, feeling that these, this is the plight of my people, my country. I'm an American, but I'm a black American. So the persistence of racial inequality is a troubling phenomenon for me. And I take it personally. Uh, I have a lot invested in that. On the other hand, how did that, that's true about my biography. But why would I want to project that onto society as a prescription for how it is that my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren should live? Uh, might I not want to be more open-minded about it? I mean, let me put it this way. Let me give you an analogy, John, because you like the religion analogy a lot when you talk about anti-religious analogy. The analogy is that I'm a, I'm a Bible-thumping, uh, uh, crudely credulous, crudely credulous, straightforward, unreflectively credulous Christian. Then I have kids, and I'm raising them. And the question is, what do I teach them? Well, of course, I teach them my crudely credulous, unreflective, straight-ahead Christianity, right? And then along comes a critic. And a critic says, uh, that's child abuse. To raise this human being to think that this myth, this set of myths that you believe, which are really uh, full of prejudice and uh, anti-intellectualism and what not is, is to impose that on your children. I almost want to take those kids away from you because you're abusing them. You know, you're raising them up to repeat within their own lives, the same blinkered, uh, unreflective credulity, which uh, has, you know, you don't own those children. This is so, this is how the argument might go. You don't own those children. You don't have a right to inflict that on them. Well, well, I don't, the, this generation with my experience outside Chicago, 1950s and 60s, I don't own the future. Why? Why is it not also questionable if I am, try to imbue, and this is what Thomas Chatterton Williams is writing about. He's a guy whose mother is white and father is black. He's married to a French woman and he's got a child. So now the child is, quote, one quarter black. And he's wondering, is the child black? And then he's wondering if he tries to make the child be black by telling the child that he's black. If he isn't, that the child is black, that he isn't doing something wrong or problematic or selfish or something when he's doing that. And I'm not saying yes and I'm not saying no. I'm just saying it's a question. It's a yes. question whether we have to reproduce in every generation the same framework. And by the way, and I'll stop. There's a story in the New York Times this morning about the census. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. Census puts out a report forecasting that by 42, the country's going to be a majority, minority country. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, most people will not be black, says the census, by some year in the future. And now some uh, demographers are questioning whether or not it's wise for the U.S. Census to put out such a forecast. Mm -hmm. And the question goes along two lines. One of them is, who is white? Whiteness is something that's evolving, so you can't predict how people are going to define themselves racially in the future, so you can't really reliably forecast. But the other point is political. And it says, do we really want to underscore the salience of racial identity to the point where we make it a headline of a report from the U.S. Census that the country is becoming majority minority. Might that not mm -hmm. provoke a backlash? Doesn't that feed into a racialized view of the American citizenry, which is problematic in its own right? Uh, and I think there's really something to that. I mean, the idea that we are so locked in to a so 20th century way of viewing the American polity that we now want to envision our future in those categories when our future is ours to make any way we want to make it. Mm -hmm. the, the child of a, a Jewish father and <coughs> East Asian mother doesn't have to be Asian, mm -hmm. quote, unquote, quote, unquote, quote, unquote. That's something that should be open to revision and discussion and, and so on and so on. So. And you notice that with most people, they understand that case that you just gave, that a lot of it focuses around the whole, you know, the black issue and a lot of people you know religion again i know i'm monotonous that you know, people performing a kind of atonement etc for reasons that i understand because if i were white i would do it too but it's interesting to look at this sort of thing and realize that there's one thing that i say to people where i notice it has some effect i say that okay you listen to everything that say you just said or the sort of things that i said before and you say well no you have to count a biracial person. And no, nobody has ever said this about my own daughters, but just in principle. You have to count the biracial person as black because of how American society is going to feel about them, which I think made perfect sense in 1950. It made sense in 1970, maybe 1990, but after that it starts getting hazy. And as a kind of person who would still insist, no, 
because of how they're seen, that's why you have to think of them as black. And the answers are two. One is, if what you really mean is the cops, which is what people mean about as much as your students mean it when they raise their hand, I say, do you really expect me to base an identity on how somebody ignorant feels about me? Why should black people think of themselves as black because of dumb white cops? And that seems to cut a certain amount of ice. And then another thing is, in general, do you really think that given the way things are now, if we have to smoke racism out so carefully so often, if we have to have these endless ticklish discussions about it, then at least you have to admit that things are different than they were 40 years ago and 50 years ago. And that means, okay, let's say that a biracial person might occasionally run into somebody who discriminates against them in some way, probably subtly, because they are not what you're going to call white. Suppose that happens to that person three times in 15 years. Is that something to build a whole racial identity around, that something like that is going to happen subtly and rarely? And so those are the sorts of questions we might ask. But I'm looking at your office right now, and it actually reminds me of one of the reasons that this sort of thing I know can only go so far with certain people and that to right now reject the categories, it's just, it's, it's unpragmatic. You've got the Once and Future Liberal by Mark Lillo, my friend Mark Lillo back there. I'm not sure why, but you have it standing up as if you're advertising it in a bookstore or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad because I... Let, let, me, let me just explain briefly. I'm trying to prepare myself <laughs> to teach my undergraduate course in the spring semester. And I've got these books up there because I, I need to read stuff in them. And I'm trying <laughs> to not let myself forget that I need to do that. What's that one on the right? What's that um, one? The one on the right is Thomas Chatterton Williams, Losing My Cool. Oh. And the one on the other right, I'm not sure what seems to be right to you, is my uh, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality. That is that. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, so, yeah, I'm looking at those. And yeah. you know, most people are just listening. They can't see what we see. But the one yeah. feature liberal is, is sitting there. And, you know, the, the, he makes such a sensible argument in that book that if we're going to make sure an idiot, sorry, like Donald Trump doesn't get elected again, if yeah. the left is going to have any real power, then we need to let the identity politics go and stop focusing on the racial division and really think more about socioeconomics and be a little bit more 1933 instead of 1993. Now, you might disagree, but as I'm sure you know, Lilla has been called every name in the book by a certain crowd for that, including by law professor at Columbia, Catherine Frank, who is white, a white supremacist. He's been called a white supremacist for that argument. And you know, this is Mark Lilla. Now, yeah, let me this is a man of the left. Indeed, this is indeed Mark Lilla, who's a professor at Columbia and whose book, Once in Future Liberal, published a couple of years ago, does argue, just as John said, against identity politics and on behalf of a kind of transracial progressive politics. He calls identity politics Reaganism for lefties, which I think is a great line. And what he means by it is, whereas uh, you know, we know what economic policy for right wingers would be Reaganism. It's, you know, every tub on its own bottom, low taxes, let the market solve the problem. Uh, and it, uh, it uh, disassociates people from social solidarity and being in the same boat with their fellow citizens. Reaganism for lefties, identity politics has the same effect, according to Lilla, namely that uh, it uh, envisions a, a polity which is built not around class interests, and uh, sort of economic justice dynamics, but which is built around identity interests, and he thinks that's a bad thing. So, yeah, yeah he, he uh, uh, came, came in for it. But, and I just but figured, again, I want to I want to say, this is my hypothesis. I may be proven wrong. I think this is all the, the vituperative hysteria with which uh, Lilla's arguable, but in my mind, persuasive argument was advanced. And calling the white supremacist, darn it, that's really just really ignorant reveals the weakness of the critics, okay? They actually are holding not a very good hand. They actually don't have any arguments. All they got is name calling, okay? Uh, the, you know, color blindness, this Harvard um, uh, Asian uh, lawsuit and whatnot and affirmative action. But I mean, the, the wheels are coming off. Okay, people try to argue that the Asians are the stalking horse for white supremacy. They're using it only because they're the non-white minority and they're calling them the model minority. And you see, it's really just a way of reinforcing white people's power. Let me just say to anybody who's listening that that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. Okay, the Asians, let me just say it, get mad at me if you want to, are testing off the trucks. Okay, this is about their merit. 
Okay. Now they're not being admitted because the university has another project and we can argue about whether that's worth keeping the Asians out or not. But this is not about white people. This is about how good the Asians are. That's what that case is about. It's not a cover for white supremacy. Saying that just reveals you don't have any arguments anymore. They're testing off the charts. You're going to tell me they don't actually know the calculus that the test suggests that they know? How, how, how is it that their verbal scores are higher than the verbal scores of many Americans who are trying to get into the same university? It's because they're working their butts off. That's how come. So, I mean, you may disagree, John, but to me, the reality of the situation is just so compelling that this cover of uh, white supremacy is the source of every uh, racial inequality uh, just is not going to hold. Well, Glenn, you know, I agree with everything that you say about the Harvard case, and I will continue to. We're going to plan some episodes of this where we're trying Indeed. to have a debate and we're going to find that we don't have anything to disagree on. I agree completely. But you also know, based on the fact that we identify the same sphere, that there's a certain kind of person who will duck and weave and spin around the buzzwords and the catchy phrases. They will have an answer to all that, which somehow comes down to that black affluent students suffer a kind of racism that makes it impossible for them to do as well as those Asian, often not affluent Students, and you know, the reason will be because of Mike Brown, because of how Donald Trump talks to April Ryan. God knows what it'll be. There's always something, and especially if it's intoned in a certain way live or put with certain buzzwords in writing, it convinces, you know, nine out of ten of the regular audience of whoever that person is. So that's why I am not inclined yet to say, let's get past race. I would rather say, let's make things better for this race that we belong to. And then we can have that conversation about how silly it was to be talking about one drop in 2018 at all. That's just my preference because maybe there's a part of me that likes to take it slow. Maybe that's the conservative in me that so many people seem to see. But Glenn, at this Jewish community center where I'm at, because I have biracial kids who I think are not going to be classified as black, (laughs) however the police feel about them, I actually have to go get them from the pool. And yeah, so, and we, um, and we don't want the cops to come in and uh, escort you for overstaying your time at whatever facility. And you know, I've been worried about that, Glenn. I'm in St. Problem. Louis. <laughs> I mean, I'm in St. Louis, and Ferguson is just down the road, so I can't be sure. Okay, so, well, my last word on this is things fall apart. The center cannot hold. The Falcon no longer hears the Falconer. I think identity politics is on its way to a well deserved uh, grave, but then uh, I've been wrong before. So I hope you're right. I hope you're right. And folks, once again, I'm sorry about the surrounding noise. This was an accident, but I will be in my office the next time and everything will be quieter. Anyway, so Glenn, yeah, this was good. Okay, thanks again. Uh, We're signing off now. The Glenn Show, I'm looking for the button. Here it is. And I...